Today on the Av Podcast, I'm joined by the producer of NPR's Invisibilia, Andrew Mambo, as we discuss The Harder They Fall, the black western flick on Netflix. It came out about a month ago. There's enough time for all of you to see it by now, so consider this your spoiler alert warning if you haven't watched it yet. All right, we break down the star of the cast and draw parallels from another star laden black western, Posse. Uh, who were the standout performances, the strong presence of the women in this movie, and how it represents, or I should say it's starting to represent, a profitable trend of black women leads on both the small and big screen, and where the future of black films and shows are going on Netflix, and way more than that. Hope you enjoy. Sasha Raff is available for your ears wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit that like button. Rate, review, and subscribe, and show love by clicking on those five stars wherever those five stars are possible. And and don't be that person. Don't be that. Don't be that person that doesn't click on those five stars because I need all of my stars. It means great things for me when you click on all of those stars. So thank you for the love in advance. And check out SashaRav.com for the catalog. Once again, that's SashaRav.com. It's the Av Podcast with Cal C on SashaRav Radio. Spoiler alert. If you haven't seen the movie yet, it's your fault. Welcome to the Yav Podcast with Cal C on South Sharab Radio. Uh, welcome to the Yav Podcast. How you doing tonight, Mambo? Yeah, I'm all right, man. You know. It's the end of the fantasy football season, the end of our rivalry, so you know, know. ready to be on better terms. <laughs> I know, I know. This this is the only reason why I, I can get you on. Only after I won in our matchup. It's the only reason why I could do it. If, if I lost, uh, we would have been talking in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I like, I, I erase from memory every time, anytime you, you beat me in fantasy football, bro. I, I, I literally actually forgot if you brought up right now. So I got to hang up. <laughs> Uh, and, and meanwhile, I screenshot it. I print it. You know, if I only had your mailing address, I'd mail it to your house. You know, I, I have it all. But it's, but it's the same thing. If I lose, it's like, what are you talking about? I, I didn't lose to you. What do you mean? Yeah, happen. yeah. I got. I got to start doing what Headley. You know what? Headley's actually was right, man. Headley's style of like, you just log off for a week, a week or two. You just can't even find the guy to talk trash to him. Just yeah. gone. Claim, claim, claims that he was busy, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ghost mode. <laughs> and like, literally, you'd be talking trash in the middle of the matchup, the middle of the game. You know, Sunday night, Monday night game, you hear trash talking from him. By the end of the game, if he loses, gone. <laughs> yeah, for like a whole week. All of a sudden, the workload piled up, you know? It's just coincidence, yeah. right on time. Pop, yeah, pop up a week later as if nothing happened. What are you talking about? What's going on? How's it going? <laughs> Anyway, it's, we're not here for that. No, uh, not, nobody not, wants to hear about your your fantasy team. No, no, not, <laughs> neither yours, neither yours. It's, and I can't even glow because there might be a chance it'll make the playoffs. So you know, it's fifty fifty right uh, now. Oh, so there's I, a I, good I got, chance you're not making. Hey, there's stop, a very stop. good chance you're not making the playoffs. Stop, <laughs> stop that, stop that. Let's let's see what happens when uh, when it pops up on. Uh, on, on 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 you know by the time this podcast airs, let, let's see what happens there. Let's see what happens. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but, I, but I was, you, you and me, you and me, gonna submit our, our, our fund to Julian at the end of the week. Don't worry, yeah, this weekend. <laughs> oh no, I mean, well, that's a given. That's for sure. That's for sure. I'm just I'm just trying to sneak in, and if I lose, I hope everybody else loses. At least I can get in that <laughs> way. <laughs> you know, we're here to discuss obviously the the Heart of the Fall movie. Um, yeah. And it was pretty interesting because, you know, and I'll get into my feelings about it in a quick moment because obviously, obviously, you know, you're the guest. So I want to start off with how you felt about it. But I'm not I'm not a big Western guy, you know, so yeah. so the fact that it pulled me in this way, it was, you know, and I'll state my reasons in a moment. But it, it was it was interesting to say the least. It was interesting to say the least. It's, it's and, and, you know, and I quite enjoyed it. But like but i want to get your feelings like what were you, what was your what was your thoughts about you know this movie when it, just from you know from watching it from watching the trailer from the time that you watched it and how did you feel about the western being so openly black i mean i don't know if i i feel like i i said this in one of our chat groups i sent the trailer for this like like in the spring like the moment i mm -hmm. saw the trailer mm -hmm. i heard about this movie i've been waiting for this film I mean, I, I had, you know, I had Posse 
on uh, on VHS back in the day <laughs> and watch that on loop. Um, man, I think like and representation representation matters, man. And I remember at the end of Posse, one of the things that that always got me was how you get to the end of that movie. And you, you you remember Posse? It's like for anybody that doesn't know, it's like film from like 1993, starring yeah, Mario Van Peebles as Jesse Lee, and he had you know, it's, I, I don't need to get into the whole plot, but essentially it's like was, you know, I, I, turn of the century gonna, story. I was gonna say you can if you want to. I mean, the statute of, of, of spoiler limitations is over by now. It's 1993. You can you can you can say what happened. <laughs> I mean, no, but essentially it's 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 a black cowboy film from you know the turn of, it takes place around the turn of the century spanish american war and uh you watch it it's like i remember at the time being absolutely transfixed with the idea like it's an almost exclusive like almost all black cast of cowboys mm-hmm. in this film and that was something you just like did not see um and at the end of the film you know they talk about how a lot of the characters, even though like a lot of the events and characters were, were fictionalized, that um, like one in four cowboys, you know, back in the day were actually black, oh, but, yeah. and that stuff has just been had been completely erased from like the history of of the story of of cowboys and and whatnot. And so, yeah, I've been I don't know I've been a, a fan. I was a huge fan of that movie, even though it got terrible reviews and and it has its flaws but like it definitely i think that movie hits different if you're you know a young a young black kid versus if you're you know roger and ebert or whatever right um it made a huge impression on me back in the day and so when i see this i see this like next generation of these stories i mean there's there's others that have come out you know recently in in years um they die by dawn i remember was one and, you know, like, I think that that representation and like kind of fixing that narrative of what a cowboy is um, that's been going on in Hollywood since like time is, is so important. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it's like I, and I remember when you, I think, yeah, I remember that when you sent the trailer and the thing that obviously pulled me was, you know, a Western being all black because I'm not a big Western guy, as I mentioned before. And mm. I can't remember a Western movie being seen in this way. And that's kind of what drove me to watch it, especially when you looked at that trailer and you saw the cast that was in it. It was all big names mm-hmm. or faces that you recognize. Mm-hmm. So you like yeah. you, you knew it was going to be at least a certain level of quality, especially be, between that and then the fact that Netflix was doing it. Like you knew it was going to be a certain a certain quality. Like, you know, what I mean, like, you knew it wasn't going to be like subpar. Yeah. It's, it's almost like just what the casting that was in it is and just the way the trailer was set up and you know trailers are set up to really excite you but it felt like it was almost too big to be mediocre you know what i mean like too big to be like crap and yeah it's funny because i i don't want to say i'm not saying this um because i am this but i thought it was really cool to be honest with you to see so much dark-skinned actors in a western and i'm not saying it like as a joke like i'm and I'm not saying because I wouldn't appreciate it if the you know the shades was lighter, but when you do it this way, it almost feels, it almost feels unapologetic. You know what I mean? Like it's like if you were, yeah. you were doing it on purpose, and and I and I think in this day and age, like you can really appreciate it. You know, like when when it's done in that in that like with that kind of like in your face, you know, unapologetic context, like it's you could appreciate that. Yeah, it's like I mean, yeah, and it's the whole thing with this film is is that it's trying to tell you like it's trying to completely change the narrative of what you think a Western film is and should be. Right. Mm-hmm. You've been with, you know, like if you watch cowboy films or you don't watch cowboy films, even if you don't watch them, you know of them, you've seen, you know, clips, you've seen photographs. If somebody says picture a cowboy, you know, people are going to sit there and have this image of John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or whatever. Right. But, right. but there was so much more to it than that. And the thing I love is like this film brings in these characters that like these are real characters like these are real people yeah. you know that love was a real cowboy Bass reeves was a real marshal yeah. you know stagecoach uh, mary was like, real too yeah stagecoach mary was real like that like uh so many of the characters in this in yeah. this uh coffee too i believe coffee you know, was real, real too yeah nah but i'm just saying like i think that like they were you know there's there's a certain purpose in this film that's like really being clear of what it's trying to do 
But at the same time, it's not just like we are going to be uh, some sort of like history lesson or, I mean, this is all fictionalized, but right. they're not trying to be just like, you need to know the names of these characters and this is, you know, a version of what they may or may not have been. But they also made it, a, I, I think, a fun movie, entertaining. Yeah. You know, it, it, it also is like the way it's shot, you know, certain scene selection that like is a nod to, old school Western films. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the cinematography. I yeah. enjoyed the acting. Um, stole the words. You know, right I think out of my like, mouth. what? Now I said he stole the words right out of my mouth with, with the cinematography. I thought the cinematography was, was, uh, was, was next level was high level. Yeah. No, for real. Cinematography was, was brilliant. And the shot, shot selection was, was on point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was liking like some of the, you know, the, the sitting when they're like, you know, going to meet guns drawn. It's, I don't know, this way it like the camera moves, all these things, the lighting, all that, that just like made me really feel like you're watching a classic Western in a way. Yeah. I mean, I think like the love story is very different in terms of an addition. It's not that's like apart from classical. I mean, I don't know all of Western, the story of, of Western film, but like, the love story maybe is the one thing that slows down the um, slows down the plot of it, but I think it's essential to feeling for the characters later on and creating a sense of tension around um, when she's kidnapped. When I don't know how much I should share. How much? What we do? We're not doing spoilers. Uh, no, you, on this. no, we could talk about. It. I'm, I'm gonna put the spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> I'm gonna put the spoiler alert uh, intro in there just so people know. You know, if they haven't watched it, right, right. so you could talk all of it. Talk, talk, talk away. You know, is is their fault? But I mean, I mean, just like it. the idea, like that that love story. You know, the kind of you need that. I think at a certain level to have your like main character, um, and really feel his motivation of getting Stagecoach Mary back, like and what he is and isn't willing to do to get her back. And so they take a lot of time to build that relationship to really kind of make you feel that and be- and make it more believable why he would do what he did and and take the chance that he takes in order to get her back. Um, but overall, I mean, I enjoyed it. It was entertaining. The cast is unreal to me. Yeah, no, like, for for sure. And and to touch on your point, like the love story aspect of it, I thought what, it, it was actually kind of cool, just in the sense that it wasn't forced. It didn't feel like it was forced. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like usually, mm-hmm. usually those like anytime I wouldn't say all the time, but you you know there there are a lot of movies which you watch where like. A situation like that, you feel like it's like it's almost forced, like it didn't really have to be in there. You know what I mean? But it's like yeah. it, it's part yeah. of the story, but it just flowed properly. Like it didn't feel like, oh god, okay, yeah, it's gonna be the love scene, and that, that, you know, like it didn't. There just wasn't that. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, kind no. of got all the way at the beginning. You knew kind of what it was within the first few minutes. You know what I mean? They got right into it, and it just it was just a blended part of the story. Yeah. You know, which which yeah. I, which I appreciate, and and the other thing too, Mambo, it's like Netflix and and you know, and platforms like these, I feel mm-hmm. like in this day and age, it's so important now for for movies like this to be made because I don't know, I, I feel like by the design of the company itself, it, it kind of allows you to take chances on projects that maybe before they wouldn't have seen the light of day, you know, because like you know, before this would have to be you know screened and tested because you know Hollywood was never sure that you could make projects or do projects like this and and make money, you know. And because Netflix yeah. is so expansive and and their reach is so unique, basically you know going from your home and your devices, you can make these projects work, and you can take bigger risks like more so than you would before, you know. And and I'm not even saying like they don't get screened and tested, you know, still, but because there's so much other platforms, you don't just strictly need the theater for a movie like this to be made. I think it's a beautiful thing at this point. And, and it's a bigger platform for black creatives to shine as well, because like 10 years ago, I'm not a hundred percent sure this movie even gets made. It might, you know, but I think there's going to be a ton of extra meetings about it. Like even with the cast, I can see, you know, some pushback, like, well, is it really going to sell in theaters? Are people really going to want to go to watch this an all black cast? Is that going to scare away, you know, a certain part of the population, a certain part of the the demographics, you know, like, like all that would have went into play. Right. Well, yeah, whereas yeah. like a movie like this now, it's like, okay, we got this, we got these people, we got, you know, these producers behind it. 
let, let's just make this movie. Let's make something cool. Bam, it's on Netflix. And now it creates its own buzz. Because, I mean, I mean, you're talking about that trailer that, you know, that was what, like April, May? So there was an anticipation for, yeah. like, you know, six months out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've been waiting, man. We've been waiting. Yeah. To see this one. Um. No, no, I, I mean, like, the industry, like, I mean, so much of it has changed in terms of, like, what is it, what, what, what could get made and what can't get made and, and mm-hmm. you know, versus back in the day. And then, you know, I would be, I would do anything to know how Posse got made. Like, real thought. 1993, making an all black cast Western film. Um, mm-hmm. But it was like the, it was like a small studio that put that out, right? I think it was... Um, uh, I think I read this recently. It was uh, Gramercy Picture. Anyways, I think it was a small studio. It was like one of the early first things that they did. But I would be curious to know, um, you know, the decisions to have like Daddy Kane in that, to have Tone Loaf yeah. in that film. I mean, how much is that motivated by, let's just get some straight up name recognition. And let's get some name recognition that people, you know, they're thinking like, oh, maybe people don't know who Mario Van Peebles is. But they'll know who Tone Loke is because Tone Loke's super famous, yeah. you know. And so you you put him in the film, um, and he's all over the you know he's all over the the marketing campaign and all that. Yeah, funky. I, I don't know. I wonder how much that like played into it, you know. Yeah, and probably did. I mean, I think Big Daddy playing uh, Big Daddy Kane. I mean, played a certain aspect of that too, right? Like at that mm-hmm. at that time, like he was still a you know pretty popular figure in the hip hop industry. So if you're trying to pull that demographic to come in, a face yeah. of Big Daddy Kane, I'm not sure if that was his first acting gig at that time, but I'm pretty sure it was. Pretty sure it was, right. Right. So it's it's something where, you know, it, it's maybe it's like, only yeah, there's this sorry? Maybe it's only acting. I mean what else have he done? Well, well I think he's done other I mean, stuff. He's done, a, he's done a few you're right. He's done a few. Yeah he's done a few things he's done right a few now. Things. But, yeah, you're right. But like that might have been like one of his first acting gigs, and and you know like that's something that you know just by intrigue, it's that would have kind of pulled you in a little bit, you know. What I mean, at least that, that there was at least an opportunity for people to get pulled in just to see what he can do on a big screen. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tolo too, right? Had Tolo yeah. done films before? I'm not sure. If, you know, he did films after that. He acted after that for sure. But I'm not yeah, sure if yeah, he filmed yeah. before that either. Like that might have been his first. So film I think too. like. Like they weren't, they weren't, yeah, they were like known, but not known for what, you know, not known for the acting. And so you got to imagine that the reason they're in there is to kind of like give it some, give it some credit. And like Stephen Baldwin was in there, Billy Zane in yeah. there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think like Mario Van people probably had some really great stories of getting that film greenlit and getting it into theaters. I would, I'm sure, I, that, yeah. I'm sure that shit wasn't hard. I would, that shit could not have been easy. I would I would love to interview him to find that out. To be honest with you, that that would be a great story because yeah. some of the movies that he's gotten yeah. to get made, like especially back then when he was directing, like they weren't easy to get done. You know? Nah, man. I mean, he's taken up from his pops. Yeah, Melvin Van Peebles. You know, RIP. He was, you know, he was a legend making movies that you're like, I don't know how the how the hell that got me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. So it's it's in it's in the bloodline. Like I think it's probably a little easier now to make them, you know, as as opposed to bef- like w- like what they were fighting for at that time. I mean, like Netflix is making decisions. Like all these places, they're making decisions on. It's just so different of what they want, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if your whole thing is who is going to pay money to go to a theater. And, you know, in the 90s of who's going to pay money going to a theater to watch a movie. Like, everything is all about box office only in, in theaters. So your calculation then is just totally different. The demographics of the country are what they were at the time. And then the, you know, the need for it to be only people who are going to theaters. Right. Now, Netflix completely changes that. People ain't got to pay $30, you know, for your $40, $50 for your whole family to go see a movie. Now your calculation is like I'm paying whatever ten bucks a month for a subscription. So what's going to bring me there to this platform? What's going to keep me on this platform, mm-hmm. right? And so now you have to be more like you just don't have a choice but to be more diverse because if you don't, if Netflix doesn't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like somebody else is going to be the place that's showing more representation and having people come out there. So it's a it's a, it's a calculation. It's a smart one they make. 
Yeah, and then, and then the homegrown statistics and the analytics are there, right? Like it's right right in their platform so they can see how much people are going to be interested to watch a movie like this by now. So, I mean, that's part of the design too, right? Where you can go and take those chances where it's like, okay, we got a oh, yeah. pretty strong demographic that's going to watch this movie. You know what I mean? That, that, that we should cater yeah. to, Yeah. you know? So, the, so yeah. it's like, there's like a Netflix kind of like, you know, it's, it's flipped the foundation on its head, you know? So it's, it's like, yeah. you're right. Like they're not, they're not playing by the same rules that they were back in like 93 when like a posse was getting made. You know? you know, considering that they spent how much money to, to make this movie in the first place and the marketing campaign and whatnot, I'm, I'm a bit surprised they didn't, like, actually try to purchase Posse and get Posse on Netflix in advance. Like, in, like, the, like, mm. you know, okay. drop the trailer for this and then drop, you know, put Posse in and, and have that film. I mean, I know those, comp- those negotiations are super complicated. And yeah, yeah. The distribution right. deals are what they are, but, like, I wonder if they, I wonder if they would have tried to get a comparable film to, like, get some stats from and I don't know. It, it's, Netflix it's, is like a black hole of information, my friend. It's just like there's <laughs> nothing nothing cuts out. But it's a it's a good nothing gets out unless they want unless they want you to exactly, know exactly. how, how big how big something was. Exactly. That's it. No, but it's it's a great comparison point though because um, you know, Posse, like, you know, especially when you go back and you know, you're the one that I'll, I'll credit you with the idea of, of, of discussing it, but like when like when you know when you, when you rewatched it and stuff, you realize like yeah, that's a big that was it, especially for its time. Like with all the names that's in that movie, especially looking at it, looking at it now, it's, it's a strong cast. You know, when oh, you look yeah. back on it now, it's a yeah. really strong cast, really strong cast actually. You know, some I mean some of the some of the actors that's in it, you like you I can't you kind of forget. You know what I mean? Like they were actually in this movie. It's, yeah. So it kind of lends to that same thing, the comparison point. Like now, I think of course this is like on a. The harder they fall is on a is on a is on a it's on a higher level in terms of the quality of it, but you know, but what you're working with back then, especially for for black movies that get made, um, you know, like it, it, there there is a strong comparison point. Like I wonder if they drew from that, you know what I mean? Like from from that kind of movie when they're writing the script, you know, Jesse yeah. Samuels or James Samuels, you know, the director and you know the people that was, that was doing the screenwriting for it. Like I wonder if they drew from those parallels too. It'll be interesting to find yeah, out, I- but. So go ahead. I, I looked up like it's like you got Mario Van Peebles, Stephen Baldwin, Billy Zane. You know we mentioned Tone Loke and and um, Big Daddy Kane, but Tiny Lister, Melvin Van Peebles. I, I remember was in there. And Blair Underwood, Blair Underwood. Reginald yeah. Bell Johnson, Isaac Hayes, yeah. Pam Greer, Ipsy Russell. It's like a like that it's, movie was it's crazy. You know? That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it was, was chock full of people, man. Now let, let's talk about the score. Were were you like me? Like, did you appreciate how well the the, the reggae classics laid the scenes out for the movie? Yo, I kept <laughs> commenting on that while I was watching it. No, I love the score of this film. It was so different. Like, I it did not go like they could. There's a very basic traditional route they could have taken, mm-hmm. and it just wouldn't have been the same. Like the 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 score of this film was. I I don't know. I really enjoyed it. Like I loved the vibe of it. I loved that it was like in a completely different vein than like a traditional Western film. You know, mm-hmm. Posse was like had that hip hop influence, right? right but right. like this was this went in a completely another direction. I loved it. Yeah, and and you know what? Like I I shouldn't be surprised. Like it's fun. like I shouldn't be surprised, even though you know. It, it kind of speaks to the connection of, of the of the two cultures, right? With uh, with country and like westerns and and reggae music, like it's because in a, in a weird yeah. way, like you know, and, and I'm sure you know this, like you know, we, especially us growing up in you know urban West Indian communities and stuff, and you know African communities, mm-hmm. but like you know being around that, like you know that like for example, like country music, you know, especially with the older Jamaican gener- uh, generation, was big for Jamaican culture. Like I, I like I know my wife tells stories about like how growing up, like she grew up listening to, you know, a decent amount of country music. Right? Because that was that yep. was a whole yep. that was a whole thing. And I remember and I mean this is another story altogether, but years back, like I um, my my family had um they had a record label, right? And mm-hmm. that that um artist, um his name was Humble. His name is Humble, great artist, like great reggae roots artist and i remember him being in one of his studio sessions and he was talking about how um he was talking about how basically like how country music had such great 
like storylines and and the stories and and country music are are it's so vast and it's so in depth. Like they kind of draw from that a little bit too, you mm-hmm. know. So I, which was interesting to me. Like I didn't even know that at the time, right? But it's like so indirectly. Like you wouldn't think that they should go together just when you see the you know reggae country you know what i mean cut not country music but like you know western like you wouldn't think they go together but man that shit blended beautifully you know like, yeah man Yo, how, how you feel how you feel you watching a western film you're like vibing with this movie this movie and then all of a sudden you hear barrington movie you're like <laughs> man. yo that man. that blend is, is is beautiful man absolutely beautiful i wish they didn't remix here i come though Honestly, I think the original on its own during that train that that, that train scene, that breakout scene, I think it would have yeah. been more amazing if they didn't touch it up. You know, it's it's kind of mm. like like what they did with the Promised Land with Dennis Brown. You know, when Rufus Black and his gang they come, or Rufus Buxar and his and his gang they come back to Redwood, like having that yeah. original Dennis Brown song, it just hit differently. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah, I yeah, wish yeah. they didn't touch it up. So it's like it's Barrington Levy. It's a classic song. So. It's still gonna have the impact, but it just it just would have hit a little bit. I don't know. It just would have hit a little bit harder. Like if it if that wasn't touch, if it was just the original song, it would have been like, oh man, you know, like you know, music, man. Is that like a? Uh, is that like um? Is it is it that, that that they really didn't want to or did want to or like? I'm just I'm just curious. Like you you know better than me, but like. How difficult is it to get rights to some music and tracks and things like that sometimes? Um, well, like, sometimes it's depending on the artist, sometimes depending on the record label getting the clearance for it. But, I mean, for a movie, like, mm-hmm. for something like this, and especially, like, it's 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 like Barrington Levy. Like, Barrington Levy wasn't signed to, like, Sony Music. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, him having to, like, clear rights or, or that record label that he was on back when the song was made to clear rights probably really isn't that hard. You know, and and for some, and then for somebody like him, as as much as a, of a legend that he is, you know, I mean, it benefits him that like a, a classic of you know of his song or the people that own the rights to Dennis Brown's music gets put into a movie like this, you know, like it, mm-hmm. it, it lends yeah. into that because you know it's on Netflix. So as long as Netflix, I mean Netflix, because they produce, you know, they're one of the producers of this movie, like that's gonna be on there for for the lifetime of it. It could be forever, right? So. Somebody yeah. can just like listen. Literally, they don't have to go to a theater to watch it. They don't have to rent it. They literally can just yep. go on their app, open their app, and boom, play it in five minutes. Like that. That yeah. is that is like a, a monumental impact that you know for for some of these regular artists. Like they, I mean, they have to take advantage of that. They have to. Yeah. You know, it's funny with like digital rights, like um, from previous places I've worked. Like I know that with streaming stuff becomes so complicated that sometimes it's way easier to hire somebody to just make a new song, make a new song just to like yeah. remake, remake a song and redo it mm-hmm. in a different way. And like, then you just own it and you don't have to worry about like redoing your distribution deal 10 years later. Like yeah. some of the stuff is like archival can be like that, like archival and music can be like, you can only get a deal for five years for 10 years. And then they're like, you have a movie that's up on the streaming platform and you've got to start renegotiating a year or two out because you got to make sure that it's not going to get taken off the platform mm-hmm. because you couldn't get this one song cleared. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, you hear this, the, the horror stories of, of certain like, like songs on albums, you know, the artists mm-hmm. losing royalties on certain songs because they didn't clear the sample. You know what I mean? Like you, you hear those horror yeah. stories sometimes. And, yeah. I, and so for movies, yeah. I would imagine it's the same, it's the same yeah, effect, right? Thing. It's the same effect, and it's probably on a on a probably on a little bit of a a painstakingly annoying scale because you know if you're the if you're a music label, especially if you're not connected to the film, like if Warner Brothers the record label or Warner Brothers the you know the the music I mean sorry the movie side they can come together really quick, but if it's like you know rival labels or something like that, it that you know that can get a little tricky because now the record label is going to want a certain part of that. You know, they they're, they're right. gonna want a little more, you know, action on that dollar. You know, especially now with the, with streaming and stuff. Like, yeah, that whole thing gets complicated. That whole thing gets complicated for real. Like, you know, um, but it's it's it, you know, it's to touch on what you're saying before though. Earlier, you're talking about like just the history of black cowboys and the impact that it had. Like, we shouldn't, to be honest, we really shouldn't be that shocked that this worked to to the degree that it did. But it, it, I I definitely mm-hmm. appreciated it. Because 
I, I appreciated it because like again, like it just it just it flowed so seamlessly. I just wish they kind of did it for the majority of the movie. You know what I mean? Because that's certain. It's like it was more at the beginning. It set the tone, though. What I, what I kind of like because, you know, especially by the time they got to Redwood, right? By the time they, you know, Rufus yeah. Buck gets back to Redwood and and he's um, you know, he's about to take the town over again. Like it kind of set the tone for the rest of the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I get it. Like you know what I mean. The fact that it's in there and and they they picked the right tracks. No, you're right. You're right. No, the music was. I haven't even looked up to see who was like coordinator or whatever, but the movie was on point. Yeah, and, and there's a soundtrack for it too. I mean, it's on Spotify, but yeah, I mean, in Apple, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a soundtrack for the movie. But yeah, it's just, it's just like I said, it just, I, I, I wasn't expecting that. I think that's work, which I think is probably oh, you neither. appreciate it better. You, you didn't expect that to to come to you, right? Like, to, you weren't expecting mm-hmm. to hear all that. So, it, it, it definitely. It puts a it, it puts a more you have a more authentic feeling about it not knowing that it's coming to you. You know what I mean? It's not coming mm-hmm. your way, so you have a yeah. better feeling about it. Now, mu- much like Black Panther, right? The women in this movie world they were uh, well represented when it came to strength. Like for you, what impact did these women have on you watching it? And also, do you think there's like a shift to show like black women in a stronger light now? I think that's just, I mean, that's just been going on, though. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, I mean, abso- absolutely. Like, you know, it, it was like a subtle thing. I'm wondering, like, uh, I mean, I haven't read anything about it, but, like, do you remember the scene where um, Trudy, um, R- Regina King's character, Trudy Smith, is, like, leading the gang when they're going to go in and rescue um, Rufus Buck yeah. from the train? Mm-hmm. She, like, raises her hand at one point. Uh uh-huh, I know what you're gonna say. Holds on the finger mm-hmm. and turns so the, turns her finger, you know, turns like the pointer finger like a like a gun and going to the le- going to the right. Mm-hmm. And like do you remember that like it just the, the immediate like power of that move and like moving this entire gang of like ten men and like they're gonna follow her direction and moving exactly what she says to do when all she does is this like simple finger motion. And it immediately reminds me of, you know, it's the exact same thing that like in um, the Denzel Washington playing Malcolm, Malcolm X, X does yep. in, in the Malcolm X film when he's just like hand up, mm-hmm. finger pointing to the right and like everybody just moves in unison and we're like, it's just like, is a moment I felt of like real power. It's one of the first ones you see of like real power, that, that moment that really like stood out to me. Um, but then obviously like, you know, um, all, all the, like, um, Stagecoach Mary's character is really, really strong. Cuffy's character is, like, super strong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Stagecoach Mary is no, you know, no traditional over. style yeah. damsel in distress. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, walks into a situation, she does get kidnapped, but she, you know, um, does her, holds her own in, in fighting to get out. Right. Um, and it's all part of the yeah. plan, too. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, as with most things, when you talk about like film and representation, women could be better represented. They could be more represented. I mean, when you think about like at that time, I don't know in, in, in terms of like portraying the reality of that time, are they, are they fully being fully represented? I mean, women rarely are, let's be honest, mm-hmm. you know, the same way people of color in general are like rarely, really truly represented in all the aspects of their roles and this, and whether that role is like principal or whether that role is support, it's, rarely represented to the to the standard with which it was you know mm-hmm. it happened in, in real life but i think like as these like main characters that they wanted to show and, and showcase they're i don't know i thought they were really good and strong great strong characters yeah yeah I, on both sides of the like on both sides of the gang and, and i like the fact that in a, in a movie like this you know they weren't shown as as you said, like dam- damsel in distress, like fragile or, or dainty. You know what I mean? Like they, they basically were ready to get it out the mud, like everybody else beside them. And yeah. you know, is, is that like it's it's it's, it's funny because like, I'm like in a, in the same way. It's like is that a is that representative of the times that we're living in now? Where we're at the beginning stages of like a black woman re- renaissance in Hollywood. You know, to my earlier point, are all these women portrayed in this manner? You know. 
10, 15 years ago if this movie, you know, was was trying to come out and, you know, without this climate that we're in now. Like, I'm not so sure. You know what I mean? I like, mean, I think I don't think you're not so sure. I think you're very sure. You know exactly <laughs> what would have happened. The movie's called Posse. There's no women in it. Like, the women are, like, <laughs> side characters in the film. That's I mean, true. the reality is, would, would the characters, would Stagecoach Mary's character have been as, like, fully realized would Trudy Smith's character have been as fully realized as they were in this film would Cuffy had been given so many like great lines and great moments and like heroic moments in this story no the answer is no that would never have happened <laughs> 15 20 years ago there's no way you could convince me that that would have I mean potentially if it was like a movie that was you know it depend on who the director was and who the producer was and and I don't know but like not with this budget, it's not. Like, I, let's just be real. That would not happen. Like, yeah. Posse wasn't even getting this budget. So, yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so different. It's so absolutely different. You take the narrative of the damsel in distress and it's completely flipped on its, on its head because Trudy Smith is the one that's saving the damsel, quote-unquote damsel in distress of Idris Elba's character who's, you know. Right. Idris, Elba, Idris Elba's character is stuck in prison and is staying in prison if not for, you know, it's not for Regina Tr- King's character yeah. going and, and saving him. Right. Good point. And I mean, that's, that's, you know, you look at it and I mean, they're, they, like I said, again, they're represented really well, you know, you know, treacherous Trudy is, you know, was ruthless, you know, being that she was like Rufus's mm-hmm. right hand man in a lot of ways. And like, yeah. they all had a power and respect angle about each and every one of them, like stagecoach Mary. And, and I, you know, I want to pronounce her name is, is it Zazie beats? Is her name? I think the the woman that plays stagecoach Mary. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you know, to, to touch on what I was saying before, it's like you know she's part of that love you know angle with with not love, but you know it's it's in a different aspect now. It's not it's not forced. It's not corny. You know what I mean? It doesn't it doesn't feel like it's it's something that shouldn't be there that storyline. But then on top of that, like you know she's originally with with the gang. And now she's buying up different saloons and properties all across the area. And then she has a woman at the boss. Yeah, she's the boss. And then she has a woman at the door, you know, who's the muscle for her at the club. You know, so it's yeah. like, so like I said, 10, 15 years ago now, you know, maybe maybe one of those three has a strong role. And it's probably Cuffy. You know what I mean? It's probably Cuffy, and to Cuffy be honest and, with you. Yeah, Cuffy Cuffy is an interesting character, right? Because Cuffy's like not, you know, um, gender non-conforming character in the, in the middle of all this, that's like, you know, interesting representation. And it's kind of, and as you're right, like the kind of character that could have existed in, in one of these films years ago as well. And, and it's also definitely representative of something that, that happened uh, yeah. plenty back in the day, right? Like plenty of, of, um, of gender non-conforming men and women who would, but like, a lot of like gender nonconforming um, people who were born as a woman who like joined the military and hid their gender identity and you know mm-hmm. like they kind of like play with it in this in this film in a way but that was definitely that was definitely a thing. I mean, I think like Cuffy's modeled after after somebody as well. Like, well, I think that was also all, one all of the real characters, characters right? right? Yeah, like I think she was, yeah, yeah, Kathy Williams, I think, in the in like in real life. But I don't, I think she oh, was yeah? not in that. Yeah, I think so. That was also based on a real character. Like that was her. Like that was she was a real character, a real person. I mean, exactly. Yeah, it's funny to what you're saying. Like the the shift is kind of already happening. Like because you, I mean, you're now seeing more shows now with black women leads that have you know proven that they can. They can, they can, they can produce or be, you know, at, at the at the the face of a vehicle of profit, right? So what are you talking about? Like like even shows like the Twenty Show with us on BET, the First Wives Club, you know, you're going to from mixish to to grownish. That's that's being spun from that blackish bubble, and even to like mm-hmm. like Insecure and that new show. I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but that new show Harlem. Like you're you're starting to kind of see yeah. that shift, so it's all kind of representative of the times that we're in now, you know what I mean? But it's just it's just it's interesting to see where that's kind of going, you know? Like, yeah, but that's what happens, man. When you change the completely, like distributions can completely change, right? Yeah. So like the power structures are completely different. It's not like whatever I don't know whatever five white guys, uh, old white men at a studio who control all the power of what does and doesn't get made. Right. That doesn't. That's not the way it is anymore. In fact, nowadays it's like 
the 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 TV series and stuff like if you you can go out and be like you know what I'm gonna start a Kickstarter and I'm gonna build a pilot on my own I'm gonna get this made yeah and then if it gets big enough uh, insecure I mean this is not you know insecure happened because you know Issa Rae did Aqua Black Girl and turned it into a thing right, right. she exactly. just made it on her own and so I just think like in so many ways and that's like an extreme example maybe but just the fact that you have more representation in general. In, in all these spaces um, is, is massive. It makes a, a huge difference, you know, who, who are the executives in positions of power at these different places. And, and on top of that too, right? Like it's, like I'm talking about the, you know, a vehicle of profit, like a show like Insecure shows you mm -hmm. that, you know, a black woman can play a lead or be a, a strong figure. And, you know, on the business side, you know, as long as it's done properly, you know, as, as you want all shows to be and, and you know, it, if you're being a creative, like it's going to generate money, right? It's going to generate a buzz. It's going to generate interest. It's going to generate money. You know, the, yeah. the buzz coming from social media, you know, and then, and then that translates into like the amount of views that's going to be there, you know, the trending topics, like it's all that ties in to see like, you know, we, I mean, we talked about this a few years ago when we were talking about, I think we had an episode um, just about, like a black renaissance of, of like TV shows and movies and stuff. And it's like, it's interesting. Like after mm -hmm. all these years, like at that point when we were doing the podcast, it's like, after all these years, it's like, wow, Hey, blackish. So, okay. We can make money from this show and people watch it. Huh? That's interesting. Like it took like 20 years for like a show like that to get made a scandal to like, you know, to get made and like, or to be made and show that like it can make money. You know what I mean? It, it could be very yeah. profitable. Yeah. It could be, you know, maybe even legendary. Like Insecure for black culture, that's going to go down as a legendary show. You know? Yeah. Like, absolutely. And even like like Blackish and those type of things. But like, like just to spin so off of those type of things. Yeah, sorry, go on. What are you going to say? But yeah, so many. And But I think it also, it's, it also depends. Like, you can't, it's like the difference of like the HBO versus network TV. Mm -hmm. And HBO is able to do and does so many other like they'll push boundaries in ways and do things very different. I mean, HBO is like has insecure, which is, which is amazing. And then, but also like I may destroy you, which is like this completely non glamorized mm. version. Like, you know, like insecure right. is a very polished LA well off young Trendy. professional space. Right. Like, so, but like they also do, they do other stuff. They're kind of like all over the place and, mm. and, they can do that because they're HBO and they don't have the same needs that a network does in terms of like the advertisers versus, you know, subscribers, it's a completely different game. People are subscribing and you know what they're watching, you know what they want, you know what, you know, you're going to pull certain people in, you know, network TV is like, we want to get people. Yes, but we want to get people and advertisers and what advertisers think people want. And it's a whole different calculation. So you make a lot of safer choices and, and, you know, down the road. Have you, there's a really good article, which I, I listened to uh, an interview with her about it, but I haven't, I, I got a copy of it. I haven't read it yet, but um, the unwritten rules of black TV by Hannah um, Georges from the Atlantic. No, I don't it's like, just like, it. it's just like definitive look at, at, um, you know, kind of like representation of black people in film and TV. Um, mm -hmm. But you should definitely check that out, especially and anybody listening who's interested in these things and like the history and like looking at you know how we went from the Cosby Show and how we got to Insecure. Um, mm. It's a really good. It's a really good. It's a good read. I haven't finished. I've like started. I haven't finished. But also, um, there's some interviews that she's done about it that are that are really interesting to hear. Oh no, I'll, I'll definitely check that out because yeah, there's definitely a. Uh, a, a line that goes from, as you said, from the Cosby show to, you know, to, to, to where we get to here now. Right. And I know Cosby shows yeah. something that's kind of taboo now because of everything that happened with Bill Cosby. But I mean, you can't deny that that show was, you know, as far as time and for TV history, I mean, it, the kind of the, it's, it's already laid out in history. Like the, the kind of impact that show had. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. And, yeah. and Cosby show beget different, you know, different world, and yeah, um, I mean, that opened the door for you know uh, other other shows, and yeah, yeah, no, 
for sure. A different world is um, iconic in itself too. It's iconic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you're still you're still seeing people, you know, wearing Hillman paraphernalia to this day, right? Like they got there's like websites and stuff that's dedicated to selling Hillman merch, right? Like it's still right. it's still out there. Like how many people wanted there. to go to Hillman? <laughs> I mean, yo, that's for real. I you know, I mean, I didn't know Hillman wasn't real at the beginning. Like watching that show, I wanted yeah. I wanted to go to university. That was part of the reason why I wanted to go to university was because of a different world. <laughs> I really did when I was younger. I loved I loved that show. Uh, but but you uh, see, but you see, like yeah, that, that, no, that's a, that's an article I, I'm i definitely willing to check out because yeah, like you, there there is a, you know, there there is a line that goes through that, right? Like, you know, the forefathers of it to like the people now that are, that are setting the future forward. Like, you know, it's gonna be interesting to yep. see, like especially with with a show like I know we're getting a little off topic, but like a show like Insecure and a Blackish that are both ending this year. You know, in 2022, it's going to be interesting to see what takes its place, you know, as, as the impact, you know, because like in the Cosby mm-hmm. show vein, like Blackish has spinoffs now. Right. It has it has spinoffs yeah. that are like setting its own trend in its own way, too. It's going to be interesting to see what what replaces that, you know, what takes its place in, in terms of like those type of impacts. Now, um, the guy, that, I guess, to kind of go back on track, like for yeah. you, who, who was the standout performance um, in this film, and that, that's probably a hard question to really ask because I, I, I'm not even sure if I even have a true answer to that yet. But I'll let you go first because you're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, no, no problem, no problem. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody that surprised me. I, mean, I think I was coming into this expecting a lot, you know, and people like felt everyone lived up to it, and um. I mean, I think Regina King's Trudy portrayal of Trudy Smith was really was super strong. Yeah, I really like Lakeith Stanfield as Cherokee Bill. Man, that, that was a great. Role. I thought he uh, his. I thought he was really. I mean, Lakeith Stanfield is great in uh, almost everything he does. Yeah, he's a great actor. Um, yeah, I enjoyed his. Uh, I enjoyed his character, and yeah. just the way his like the way he would get annoyed at certain things, and he'd be like, "Do we have to do this?" You do this, and I do this. I'm gonna kill you. Like it's just like the thing. Why do we have to go through? Like just like a lot of the very subtle, I don't know. Very subtle, but very yeah, serious. Like, yeah, yeah. It was almost comedic. Um, it was almost comedic in some parts, but I mean, you know, Idris Elba. Idris Elba. He's brilliant. I mean, Jonathan Majors. I'm. I enjoy his his character. Um, mm-hmm. I enjoy Jonathan Majors as an actor as well. I mean, I love Lovecraft Country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like if I had to only pick one, I don't know. I guess I'd pick Lakeith Stanfield. Cherokee Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His portrayal was just um it was like a very calming force in the middle of all this like chaos. Mm-hmm. Like he felt like the only character he, he was one of the characters who was just like projected a certain calmness that was fascinating in this space of complete chaotic not anarchy, but like it is the wild west and, you know, anything can happen and he it was just enjoy. It was fun watching, you know, like when he's like knocking at the door, like, "Hey, you know, like let us in." I know you've got like ten guys in there with guns, but you should open the door because we have your son. Let's not, yeah, let's not make this. <laughs> let's not make this any worse than it has to be. Um, like, like he's trying to yeah. do it with a certain level of civility. Like it's it's hilarious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, I liked it. I liked him a lot in the movie too because, um, you know, and and and. Sometimes you know, growing up, you you would like sometimes you know we say that the tough guys sometimes wasn't the guys that barked the loudest, right? It was sometimes yeah. it was those sometimes it was those quiet ones and those guys that were pretty calm or really calm, and those sometimes those are the tough guys like that would give you the most trouble, or that would give the most trouble, I should say, right? Because they yeah. they just had a sense of calm about them because they they knew like I, I don't have to you know, I don't have to bark loud. I I know I my bite is real, right? And he kind of yeah, represents yeah. that. He kind of represented that. Um, I, I think for me, I would say Jonathan Majors. It's I would say if I had to choose, um, it would probably be him. You know, I think I think he did a great job playing that love. But I, I think it's hard to to really select one. I was trying to challenge myself to to see who who I would select because I, honestly, most of the actors. And I'm not saying this movie was like an like an iconic movie or a great movie, like an incredible movie, but like. 
most of these ca- most of these actors they played their roles well, so it's, it's kind of really hard to choose a standout. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah. it's, it's hard. It's hard to kind of choose one. And no, I, I and and for me, like you know, I think you got to give love to Delray Lindo. I think you see he, he's a he's an actor at this stage. Like he needs. He needs, you know, they say like, you know, they get your flowers. Like he needs like his bouquets a little more now. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. like for him, like when you see even amongst the strong cast that it is, when you see his name in it, it kind of provides like a foundation, a floor of legitimacy. You know what I mean? Like when he pops up on the screen, like if you see a good cast and you see he's in it, you know, that at the very least, the movie's not going to suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. <laughs> I feel like, yeah. I mean, I I, I got to think about his his entire uh, filmography of whether or not he's been in a movie that sucks. But like, I, I think the one thing I'll say it definitely projects. You know, there's going to be a character who's going to just be this um, kind of like no nonsense. Listen down, listen, listen, young buck. Like this is what's mm-hmm. going to happen. Character is going to it's like it's this bread and butter man. Like he, whether he's whether he's being a, a, a marshal, you know, Bass Reeves, and he's being a marshal on the side of the law, or whether he's being uh, in Clockers, and he's just like the head of a drug empire, mm-hmm. he's gonna play that same character. It's just like, let me tell you how things are gonna go. Let me tell you what's what. Yeah, like you're from Clockers to Crooklyn. Obviously, his role in Crooklyn was amazing, but like even yeah, even yeah. a movie like like Gone in sixty seconds, or like even like a Get Shorty, like you're right, he does have that 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 kind of role about him and it's when it's funny because i had a chance to meet him like years back i think it was during caravan actually me and my brothers we had a chance to meet him and he, of course and, you did caravana yeah what do you want me to say man i don't know if he was filming something Please. here but <laughs> oh go on no, but 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 the funny thing is, he like is the same demeanor. Like he had the same kind of demeanor when you when you when, oh, you, yeah. when you met him. It was just it was like hilarious. You're like, damn, it's just like the movie. <laughs> like he's just yeah. like his roles. Like damn, you know, right? It's just it's what he gets hired to do. It's like <laughs> he's gonna be that 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 he's gonna get hired to be whatever he is. He's gonna be hired to be some character who is just like I'm I'm the boss in this space. Like respect respect me and you know everybody listen up and everybody's younger than <laughs> yeah <laughs> everybody's young and they gotta listen and understand and you know um nah it's always fun seeing his character uh, on the screen for real absolutely yeah and i mean he's a very accomplished actor and i mean he's he's like it's, it's funny because like when you think about him he's not one of those guys that's like he's gonna be on your top five list of actors and that type of thing but like you you just you never have anything but good things to say when you see him. You know what I mean? Hey, in case I ever meet Delroy Lindo, I'm not saying that he's not on my top five. No, I'm not. I'm not. I wouldn't tell him that either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, um, so you know, I, I would say like overall, like what it looks like there's going to be a part two. You know, for just for you know, based on the ending. Like, could do you think this sets up for future westerns, black westerns, or or at least more of them, a little more of them than you know, like then the the gap from like a posse to like now. Not I know there was other movies in between, but the like, but it was it's few and far between. Do you feel like there might be more of them down the line, based on what happened here, and and especially seeing that there could be a part two? Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. I think it's going to be more of like you know, um, these spaces are seen that you don't have to have. Uh, Magnificent Seven, and you're like right. you got Denzel Washington, and but you know, ah, oh, we're maybe afraid to put uh, any one or two more in there because you know people might get the wrong impression of what this movie is or whatnot. You know, I think like, yeah, I expect to see more of this because the westerns are not going away. People love this time; they love, love seeing westerns. this time. They love seeing it represented. They love the action that it comes with. It's like you know this kind of like exaggerated lawlessness that that people enjoy entering into and so i expect to see more of it i expect to see more representation like this i think going forward like you're i'd be shocked if i actually see a an all-white cast in a western film where like there are no you know significant roles for 
or black or Latino, let's be honest. Like yeah. where's the where's our where's a Western where we really kinda like, you know, represent the Latino contribution to um to to like Western cowboy kind of culture. Yeah, like 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 uh, the like the days of the cowboys and Indians are like like far far away in the past, and that'll, like that'll never happen again. You know, kind of like thank God, I, yeah. and maybe subconsciously, maybe that's why I didn't, I wasn't a fan of those movies, like the John Waynes and those type. I know they're supposed to be classics. I just never, I just it just it just never stuck with me. It was just never my thing. You know, and especially as also you get like a the older. realization. Sorry, Go ahead, I was gonna say, and the, just like the, the the representation of like. The realization, everybody, people know now more that, like, the stuff was way more complicated than this, right? There was no, the, like, when you think about, like, Oklahoma, all these, like, places in the West, yep. the, the mixing of, like, Black and Indigenous Native American culture was, like, a lot of mixing, you know? Yeah. A lot of these, like, you know, cowboys of that time period were were part Native American, part Black, and, like, that was a reality like i just think that yeah a lot of the ways it was represented in the past is just not going to be the way it is going forward and i think you're going to see different representations of native americans and western different more representation of like latinos and and um black people in those spaces and i would be surprised if you have a western film and you don't see that like that would be it would take i think it would take effort to continue like kind of like whitewashing Mm-hmm. that that time that era i i feel like there should be i i guess like there should be more of them like i think the thing is you don't see them often enough like you know as we're talking about the last 30 years only for me yeah. like you know prior to like magnificent seven and like you know and i don't really count django as a black movie black western you know, even though jamie you know jamie fox played that role and you know um Kerry washington and samuel jackson was in it whatever but like yeah. Like to me, only Posse and like Ro- uh, Rosewood are the only ones that come to mind to me. You know what I mean? Um, but like, it falls under the kind of like the same thing of like certain movies can't get made because the public won't respond to like, you know, seeing blacks in the lead until they do well, and then you know, as we were saying before, it's like kind of like a big surprise. But at this stage, it's, it's yeah. becoming more of the norm because look, I mean. You, you want, if people want to go about the critics and, and what it's rated as, 80, 87% approval rating on, on was on Rotten Tomatoes, right? So, like, and that's a reputable, uh, reputable uh, website to, you know, for, for a movie you know, to be critiqued on. And so, like, there is a market that, like, obviously, yeah, we could do more of these. You don't want to overkill it now, right? You don't want to overkill that genre either. But my point is, like, making three or four of them within a 30 year period is like, at this stage, you can see it's 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 inexcusable, especially when there's money that can be made on it, right? And, and you know, to to the point that we were making before, like there's so much platforms to do these kind of movies on now. It's it's hard to come up with more excuses as why they should not be made. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's gonna happen. And like, okay, I, I say if people want to overdo it, overdo it, like. Nobody thinks about, well, have we had too many John Wayne movies? Like, nobody thought about that shit back then. Like, just make them. <laughs> make them. And, and it, you know what I mean? Like, if they're good, it, I don't think it matters. If you have, like, 10 all-black cast or majority black cast Western films that come out every year, it's not going to be overdone if they're done well. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, there's no... Overdoing is, is like, it feels overdone when it gets when it starts to get tired and the... And like nobody's making the effort to really like mm-hmm. switch up the style and yep. the plot, and it kind of just becomes like a bit rote like that. Yeah, but um, nah, like a cookie cutter style. Yeah. Like yeah. make as many as you can. I think like and like you know, westerns are. This is in general. I don't know if there's even that many westerns that get made, right? They kind of like come up every now and again, and right. it's like this thing that it's just like it's as well that Hollywood goes back to every now and again, but. Now you've got different players. You've got Netflix. You've got Amazon Prime. Like, you know, I'm sure we'll see more. I, I'm curious to know. I wonder if they'll do a, a sequel to this. But um, well, just just know. based on the way it ended, I, I feel like it's not over. You know what I mean? Like, there, there, at least there might be a part two, which would be a little tough because you know some of the characters that get killed in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's people uh, that like obviously wealth of yeah. Yeah, so it's like it's like you know who do you replace that with? You know what I mean? Who's the new crew? 
like what goes into it, but you don't feel like it's over. Like it's the way the way it ended, it don't feel like it's over, right? Like, no, nah, yeah, and, and, no, I see, I see that, yeah, yeah. And, and, the question, I think, like Netflix is a weird space, though, whether or not they'll actually do it. Like, I don't think I feel like I don't understand. I don't understand why they do what they do. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, what do you <laughs> explain, explain? Like, I don't fully understand, like, like why Netflix, like. I, I don't know what their calculations are in terms of like whether they would or like what would it take for like I feel like if they had if this was a uh, uh, like regular theatrical release from like whatever Warner Brothers or Sony Pictures mm -hmm. and it made X number of dollars I'd be like yes there will be a sequel yeah. Netflix I don't know you have no idea right? like Netflix is a kind of like space it's just like yeah we did that we're good let's keep moving like they just and, and, I don't know. And, and the I feel like there's are, a lot of shows they just stop and they just decide, no, nah, we're done. Let's do something different. And they don't really always go back. There's some shows that they just keep going back to and back to, you know? Um, like like Frankie and Grace. It's just like so many seasons of that show. Right. And is it because they can't, they've reached a demographic with that show that they can't figure out how to reach with a different product. And so they have to keep going back to Frankie and Grace. Whereas like if they make, a, you know, the how do they fall? And then the demographic of people that like watch this also watch this other thing. Well, we don't need to go back to the how do they fall. They can, we can give them this. And yeah. like, I just feel that they make decisions in such a different space than traditional Hollywood did that I, I have no idea what they'll do, <laughs> it's, it's, but I would love to see a sequel. Yeah, for sure. And it's based on, I think it deserves a sequel. And, you know, it, it's like yeah. I said before, like it's based on the analytical stats in terms of what like what demographic is going to watch what. Right. So it's like we don't know, like, you know, you know, obviously, you know, when you compare it to a box office draw, you could say like, hey, this movie took 60 million dollars to make. It made 200 million dollars in the theater. Well, you pretty much know if there's there's a there's a there's, a, there's a, at least there's going to be an an option for a sequel to be out. You know what I mean? Whether they do exactly. it or not, exactly. at least you know, like, okay, the, the, the option of having a sequel is in play, but Netflix doesn't, they don't disclose the profits and the ratings for, for movies like this, especially the streaming numbers. So you don't really like, at least publicly, we don't know. Like the average person isn't really going to know. You have to kind of deep dive into it. You know what I mean? To know what, yeah. It, yeah. what like, like how well it did. And you know, if, if it's in that option now where like a sequel could be done. Oh, deep dive into it. Like you just, you ain't gonna know, man. No. Like they just don't release. They don't release their numbers. No. So like, you just won't know. Like they don't even tell the filmmakers fully what a, a thing did or didn't do. Like that was a that was a thing, man. It seems like not knowing exactly how many plays everything got. Like they'll tell you, like you know, what was it? Like Squid Game. They shared what happened to Squid Game, right? They're like. Yeah. Good game was streamed this many times in the first, you know, month, and you know that because it broke records, and so Netflix wants to share with everybody that like, hey, this was this crazy thing, and people are talking about it, and then other people go like, oh, now I want to see it, right? So they share these like massive successes, yeah, but they almost only share like these exceptionally massive successes. Everything else is just the filmmakers, all the actors in this film. Like, this is the weird thing about Netflix. is like the actors in this film, Jonathan Majors, you can talk to him, he doesn't, he legitimately does not know. I mean, maybe he does, but like he legitimately very well couldn't, might not know how well this movie did. <laughs> how many people watched it in the first week, which is crazy. And for somebody that's like... How Netflix operates. And for somebody like him, how do you drive your, your earning potential going for, like, for future projects, right? So it's like... For somebody like him, like, you know, again, box office, box office mentality, you know, you're looking at it and you're like, okay, well, this movie drew $200 million. Now, when you want to do a part two or if I want to do any other movie, well, the price just went up, right? Like yeah, Fat Joe yeah. says, you know, like uh, yesterday's price ain't today's price. The price just went up now. So, you know, I made, you know, $4 million for that movie. Great. Well, I want 10 now. I want 15 now, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you, you're just yeah. looking at the hardcore numbers, right, of of the profit that's made. But Netflix, is that like is that like a way of kind of controlling it? I don't know, because like how do you gauge that going forward to say like, hey, well, the streams did this, so I'm worth this. Like is that yeah. – are we still in that infancy stage of trying to figure that out? You know what I mean? Like I guess that's the other question that, you know, again, we don't know, right? Like 
how how to like how, as an actor like a, like somebody like a Jonathan Majors like you know like like all the other actors that's in the movie how how do you generate that going forward? It's yeah, how do you make how do you do a back end deal if uh, the numbers aren't completely public and you're not allowed to know all that what they are? Yeah, just trust us. We'll pay you. We'll pay you accordingly, a percentage uh, according to the number of street. Like you can't have a back end deal when you don't know what the heck the back end is. Is yeah. Like, do you get you a know, percentage like Tom, of the movie? Tom Cruise is famous for that, right? Like, Tom Cruise is famous for back-end deals on a lot of his movies, right? Like, right. just impossible movies, I think he does. Like, mm-hmm. he takes, he still gets a massive salary, I think, but he also gets a huge, like, back-end deal if, if the thing does really well, which they tend to do, and that's where he makes a lot of money. Can't do that if it's just strange. Yeah. But yeah, no, the whole industry is totally different, man. And that, then that, and and going back to the beginning, it's just like the whole industry is is upended and changing with the streaming services. Mm-hmm. And now we're luckily, luckily, we get different movies. We get diverse movies, with different casts. We get characters. We get you know soundtracks that we would not see in a lot of other spaces yeah. before. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm all for it, man. I love it. I want to see way more. I mean, I want to see, sure, I want to see a sequel to this. I want to see more black wrestlers. I want to see, you know, black space movies. I want to see black, I want to see, or just like more equal representation. Like, yeah. doesn't necessarily even always need, doesn't need to be, you all know, black, an all black yeah. cast. Like, I just want to see that diversity. I want to see more of that diversity. And I feel like you get more and more of it with these streaming services than you did from a traditional um, media companies in the past. Now, now to wrap up, like, what are what are your overall thoughts? Like, you know, as we had this discussion, like, what are your overall thoughts of of the movie? Because, like, one of the things that, like, you know, we you know we talked about the the directing, the the cinematography, you know, the fact that it was shot really well, it, it kind of set the standard on a, on a you know at a certain level. But the one thing that I loved about it was the mm-hmm. um, was the Afrocentricity of this, you know, like. Cause, Cause to me, there's a part in the movie, right? Like where, um, I think Nat Love is trying to propose to to Mary, you know, and mm-hmm. and there's a part where like you know like he gives her like a hug, like he's standing behind her, he gives her a hug, and his face is basically like, almost like made into one with her with her blown out afro, you know. And I thought that mm-hmm. was like I thought that was really shot well, you know what I mean? Like if somebody yeah. took a snapshot yeah. of that, like that would be a great picture, right? Yeah, which yeah. is which again is not something you always see, you know. So I, I think that was like things like that was like really important as well, right? Like like yeah. like I don't know. To me, that was like a lasting image. It was like kind of like the Afrocentricity of, of it. You know what I mean? Like and it, and it kind of represents the times. You're not expecting people to be there with like a Caesar and, and the fade and all that stuff, right? But it just mm-hmm. but it just it brought a certain level of like that into it right like it brings a certain level of, of authentic authenticity to it right so like i don't know it just it just it it like i really like that 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 particular scene i thought was like i thought it was well shot like it was short but it was just really well shot you know because you're, you're, yeah. you're like you're capturing the blackness you know what i mean like in it no i think there's a lot of like shots that you know there's a lot of really great cinematography in here and um, you know, like single shot takes that they do and uh the the eyes, like the way that they like the shot selection and like kind of like classic western style of like honing in on people's eyes mm-hmm. and letting people just like do this like acting through the way that they look. Eddie Beach has a has a moment in like the way that she's looking when Jonathan Major's character is getting beaten. He's been taken into custody. Right. He's being beaten. Um, they're like, I remember it was quite like, I don't know. It was like, it's really kind of brief, but I remember being like, hmm, like you feel that, you know, like the look in her eyes and it's just like the shot selection, the way it's like tight on the eyes. Yeah. No, there's a lot of really great moments in this. Were you, were you expecting the plot twist? I mean, I, I saw, I saw it coming, but like, I thought I, I'm going to, I'm going to wheel that back. I am not that. I did not see that coming the entire film. But, like, when you get in there, I don't know why, like, the, it was something about the calmness of of um, Rufus Buck in the end. Mm-hmm. 
and the like resigned nature to to what was happening that I that in that as it was coming to that moment before the reveal, I was just like, son of a bitch. like, it, you just had this feeling that like, why would he be the way he was? Like, why would he be resigned and calm mm-hmm. and not trying to like really fight? Yeah. Um, so I think it was a brilliant plot twist. It was uh, age wise, it didn't make the most sense, but like that was just. <laughs> Um, that just is what it is, but like it was an it was a very interesting process. I think it was a bit too simplistic, um, and like made it a little. They were trying to make it a little too tidy. But, like right. I wasn't a, I. I think it was an interesting idea. I think like really hard to execute because, and yeah, I guess you're saying spoiler alert, but like his his like motivation, Rufus Buck's motivation doesn't make a ton of sense. And so that was kind of missing for me. Well, yeah. Like, I like, think you uh, need to, I think you need to be in his head at the time when he did what he did at the very beginning of the movie mm-hmm. in order to really, truly understand what he's doing and what happens at the end. And without that, I don't really understand why he didn't kill him in the beginning, why he like, why he lets him live in the beginning and then why he lets him, you know, kill him in the end. Like it doesn't, you just not, you don't you don't have enough Rufus Buck in order for the ending to really make to sense. To be that way, honestly. Y- yeah, that, that it was... doesn't is his motivation really missing? His mentality, his mindset is missing. He's like villain, 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 and then he's like, oh, he's like this like tormented villain that may may have a sympathetic leaning to it, right? And like you kind of understand why he did what he did, and then he just is like resigned to his own death. It just doesn't make it doesn't hold up to me. Yeah, like they, they didn't. They but it didn't, was it was it was a it was a unique twist that you weren't expecting. But it wasn't. I don't feel like it was. If that was, I mean, the, the I mean, like I said again, I think there was a couple of flaws in it, and that was one of the flaws. Is like that yeah. character wasn't yeah. fleshed out enough for somebody that has such an important role in it. Like you figured, like even if he tells him what happened, there should have been a a, a, a there should have been a to the death scene. You know what I mean? That that shouldn't have been like it should have ended the way it did, like where he's basically like no resistance and like basically like kill me because you caught me kind of thing. Like it's almost like you got to the yeah. end of Mario Brothers, you know? <laughs> it's like it's yeah. like you get to walk out of the castle now. Hey, thank you for coming. It's like no, like you needed to have like a a, a fleshed out final scene. We would have you. It was it was building up to that, right? Like everything was getting taken think, down, and it was like it was building to exactly. that moment. Exactly. It didn't even like they didn't even he didn't even try to convince him to join him as his as his brother. You know, it's like it's like he just gave up. It's just weird. Yeah. And like maybe, you know, if you really flesh out his character and you go from the beginning all the way to the end, like you really understand and maybe you understand where his where his mindset is and why he's doing what he's doing, but like they don't do that. And so you're just kinda of left with the major villain that you're chasing the entire way and you're waiting for this massive confrontation and you're expecting one thing out of him and you just get the complete opposite at the last second and then you're like oh wait he's actually a, he was actually a victim himself like you're like mm-hmm. okay this is this is it just it lacked yeah like it, like they, there should have been and i mean it's a movie like we could have spent another 10 minutes like them fighting it out or negotiating something and then fighting it out like the, like the, like I said, it was like it was a unique idea that just it just it felt a little incomplete. And I think the other part yeah. to me was like the 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 Quentin Tarantino Tino level of of bloodshed in the movie it was almost. And I think maybe it was by design, like that's what they were going for. But it was almost cartoonish at times. You know what I mean? But like it, I think at the yeah. same time, yeah. it was I think that's that was the point too. So it didn't bother me yeah. that much. I know some people it bothered, but like it didn't bother me as much. Because I think that they were going for that. Yeah, it didn't bother. It didn't bother me. It was it was a bit comical, like the very first one when the when the the title sequence comes on. Right. The harder they fall, right. and it's like the first shot is the, and he like goes flying in the air, and then mm. it's like the harder, and he's like shot again in the air, and he's flying like each of the each of the steps that he like you know, um, and then finally the last shot is the one that has him falling on the ground like, and it's like, like almost summer fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like the words fall come across. You're like, man, this is, that was a bit on the nose, but, <laughs> but it was, what about, um, you remember when they go, there's one thing that I thought was really interesting. Um, 
from a cinematography standpoint and like from an overall like set standpoint was when they go to that white town but they're in like mm. the black town you know it's like got color and it's yeah. just like there's everything is different and like there's a diversity of color and, and textures all over and then they go to the town that's just like everything is gray or everything is like white mm-hmm. washed yeah like everything it's like all white people and it's just like every single building is white, the benches, the mm-hmm. windowsills, the curtains are white, like every <laughs> single thing in the whole town, the garbage cans, like where you, where you, you know, like it, it was, I thought that was like, it was so on the nose, but it was actually, I didn't mind it. It was, I thought it was an interesting aesthetic choice. Yeah. And, and then calling it Maysville, like, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a little funny, the name, like. You know, like, it, and then it's funny because I think it, they, when they flash out on the screen is Maysville, and then in the back it's like, yeah, it's a white town. Like, I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and it's like you see it, it's like, yeah, like you, you they, yeah. Like, they they could have nailed it more, you know, with that name because it's like, no. it's Lily White to that point. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. But you, but you're right. Like uh-huh. the the contrast between the two, like it, it was interesting. You know, they, they, yeah, but it's, but like I said, overall, it's, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely pleased with it. You know, I'm, I'm definitely, like I said, I wouldn't sit there and call it a classic, but it's, it's definitely something to discuss, especially with the lead up, the trailer, as you're mentioning, all the way up to now. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's something definitely that, you know, we, we should have, we, <laughs> that we, you know, to talk about as a topic. Like, I think it's something that, uh, it's worth discussing for sure. You know, like the, the I thought yeah, the movie was, was good overall, and, and and I think for me, like I appreciated it more watching it the second time. Like I think because you know we're breaking this down and to watch it a second time, like I, I like I it actually like I liked it more the second time I watched it actually. You know, which which yeah. kind of surprised me a little bit. You know, you watch the movie the first time, you're thinking, ah, like you know, it's not gonna have an effect like a like a greater effect the second time, right? But Watching it the second time and really taking it, I'm I'm like, yo, like this, man, this movie's this movie's more like it's, I'm I'm not giving this movie enough credit. Like this movie's actually good, good. Like you know, like it's like damn. That's dope, man. It's a dope ass movie. It's just a yeah. fun adventure, <laughs> like you know. I think I love it. Like you know, we used to get to the place where we're just we we I I put a lot into this, and I'm like reading. I read a lot into it, and it means a lot. But like, I also want to get to the place where it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like where like it just I can watch this, and it's just. Just like any other Western film, you know, like it right. doesn't have to mean all the things because we get to a place where it's more normalized. It's more, yeah, exactly. The same way, it's the same way. Like I, I say that, like I want to get to the place where I'm not stressed out by every, you know, black TV show that's not great. Like I want them all to be great. Mm-hmm. And you're like, ah, I think we should live in a world where, like, I'm like, it's fine. They can be bad, and like yeah. having a bad TV show that's like. All or bad film, it's an all black cast. Doesn't mean you know you'll never see another one again. You know, mm-hmm. I think for a lot of years that was the feeling was like they all had to be hits, they all had to be great yeah. because if they weren't, then we ain't never gonna see another one. You know, it's like it's like all your hopes and dreams were riding on that on the success of like the Wayne's Brothers or something, right? Like <laughs> exactly, exactly, and you're like, oh man, what this thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you're, but you're right though it's, it's gotta be it's it, there's gotta be a, a more of a normalcy when it comes to comes to it all and i think that's kind of happening now right like because of all the platforms like lord knows i mean I've, I've watched quite a bit of you know um subpar movies that were black and cast you know what i mean and, <laughs> and they still keep coming right like so, to yeah. your point so it's like i think we're we're at that stage now but like it's just cool to see something like this and 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 it's and it's a big budget for it. It's a big cast. It's all black. It's 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 you know, authentically unapologetically black. And you know, like that, like the fact that like it's done so well. The cinematography of it is shot so well. Like it's like this should be you know like obviously you know when you when you you're doing something like great in nature. Like you want it to be. You want everything to be great for for that content, but I like, sorry for that you know for that for those creators that are making these kind of projects. But you know they're not all going to be home runs, but you definitely want to see more doubles and triples for sure. You don't it, you know what I mean? Like yep. so, so yeah. I think that's 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 like the positive of it all, right? Like you you definitely want to yep. see more coming down the pipeline. Um, but before we, we go, we sorry, go ahead, go ahead before we wrap up. 
No, I said, yeah, we're not. We're there. We on our way. Yeah. Now, before we wrap up, man, um, you know, um, before we let you go, first of all, thank you for coming on the pod. Um, you know, in the midst of Thanks fantasy football season, like, you know, the fact that you would take the time to, to do this is, it's, 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 it's pretty good of you, you know? Done, bro. My season's in the trash. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're in a good space. That's why we're in a good space. Yeah. Your season's in the trash too. Don't yeah. worry. Don't, 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 don't get it twisted. Don't speak ill will on my team, bro. I, I don't think you should do that. Um, I speak reality, good. my it's, friend. It's don't, not, don't worry about, don't, don't worry about the play, fantasy football playoffs for yourself. It's not Just good focus for focus on next season. It's not good for karma. <laughs> it's not good for karmic purposes, man. I don't think it should be that way. Um, but but yeah, but I just I you know I want to give you this space you know the next thirty seconds to whatever however long you want to take, um just to let people know what you're doing what you're working on or what could we expect to see from you, um the producer you know of 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 what you what you got going on, and what we could look out for from you. Yeah, I mean we just wrapped. So I you know I work at uh, an NPR uh, a show called Invisibilia, um, and we do um, narrative storytelling about like. The tagline has often been the, the um, hidden forces behind um, human behavior in the past, and we've kind of like changed and and moved into just like we're doing a lot more just focus on like good storytelling and often trying to find angles of like hidden forces behind things, you know. Um, so we just had a season that just wrapped, and it's about uh, friendship and and really kind of like digging into a few different aspects of, of friendship and telling stories that are, uh, illustrate um, friendship in different ways. Now, it's by no means a definitive telling of friendship. That wasn't what we were trying to do, and it's not what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, you know, we have stories about, you know, betrayal and stories of, you know, ghosting and um, stories of, you know, people going to therapy and, and working on friendships through, through therapy and, and what that did for them and, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a interesting season. Um, and that just came out that just like wrapped in the beginning of November. And so now we're like in this mode of, of storytelling, story finding. And so I'm on, you know, I'm basically doing a lot of like research stuff, looking for stories. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to a few things right now and then, uh, we start, you know, we'll, we'll, we have a pitch meeting coming up and we'll look to try and get a few things greenlit so we can start you know reporting and, and producing them um and then hopefully have a season that's coming out you know by the summertime or the early fall um got some other projects and stuff i'm gonna be working on in the spring but yeah that's that's me no i appreciate that man and just like i said when when it comes closer to those launch dates uh yeah definitely come back on and and you know and, and plug the hell out of it and <laughs> let people know you know so yeah, we, we can definitely it. check out for it all right, sir. But thank you once again, as always, man, for you know for for taking your time to hop on the pod, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, man. Appreciate you uh, inviting me. Yeah, man. Always. It's always good to chat with you. For sure, for sure. Thank you for checking out the latest episode of the App Podcast. A special shout out goes out to Andrew Mambo for discussing the harder they fall on Monday. If you're a music lover. Um, <laughs> We're going to be doing um, an anniversary episode on a classic moment. Um, about 20 years ago, there was a legendary beef with two legendary artists. And from that conflict, a classic album was born. 20 years ago this week, Stillmatic was born. And we're going to break everything down for you on Monday. All right. And we're going to have a couple of more episodes to wrap up 2021, including the episode tomorrow on the first third of the NBA season, which is a good one for you sports fans out there. Um, continue to rate, review, and subscribe to all of the shows from South Sharav Radio. And check out SouthSharav.com for all of my past shows. Once again, that's SouthSharav.com. For Andrew Bombo, this is Cal C. And you just tuned in to the Av Podcast on South Sharav Radio. All right, until tomorrow, folks. Peace. We out. We out.